Yeah, we're going. Okay. So I wanted to talk about just just in terms of of global collaborative development. What kind of understanding is it, is required between the different people that engage in it so that people can collaborate? And of course, you have to have a in order for that to happen, people have to be familiar with the process and the, and to begin with the idea that public development is possible. Because a lot of people are used to simply working working in secluded ways, not really on large collaborative teams. So I talked how how the mindset of collaborative development. Uh, as long as a number of people share that, then it can happen. One of the main challenges for hard, open hardware is that not a lot of people do know about this kind of work. It's not part of familiar culture, so it's a challenge. And, it's, it's, and the way we get over that is if there's enough people that actually do it. So, uh, for example, in 20, 2012, we did the open source hardware documentation jam where we defined a basic taxonomy for what documentation should include. It should include things like the project name, the version, the repository, the, the history of the project, things like that. There's, there's certain things you have to document for a project, for new projects to build upon it. But, you know, no matter what we do on that, you know, we can have an advanced, excellent development template or procedures within the wiki, but, it, but the other missing requirement is people. We need to have people to do that. Without that, uh, whatever you do, it's like writing an academic paper or whatever. Uh, unless people read it or unless people know about it, you don't get buy-in. Uh, so, so the, the second challenge is is getting people. In. And as as I mentioned, that the number of people that do engage in open open economic development is so small that effectively an economy that it doesn't exist. So, what do we do about it? Uh, the techniques that we're developing here are based on the wiki, cloud collaborative, collaborative docs, common tools, as I mentioned. And we use some other, other things, like the design jams that we will be developing, which I talked a little bit about before, and the incentive challenges, which are a way to get uh, that awareness into a much greater public. So platforms like the uh, XPRIZE Foundation, I mean, those are well-known things that, that get many people involved in a deep way. So, so when you throw up a prize, like, for example, like, say the Automotive X Prize, I don't know what it was, like, a, I think they, they threw a carrot on a stick of, like, a million dollars for the winning entry. Um, right now, I believe some of that is continuing as startups that are trying to still kick that off. But that basically got a lot of people excited about it, people worked on it, and the teams that did work on it, put in millions of dollars of development for a million dollar prize. Well, how does that happen? It's, it's just part of the psychology. It's an incentive challenge that does work. So we do know that uh, if we follow other projects that have done that successfully, like, like the, the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, we know that incentive challenges work. So, and that is now quite accessible to many people, um, well, to anyone, actually, anyone who, who cares to do it. Um, there's a book called Bold by P Peter Diamandis. Uh, those are the guys behind the XPRIZE. Um, but that talks about all the methods of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing for the, the reward itself. So uh, the, the one platform we are going to use as part of, the, part of the immersion program and something that we want to go forward with is HeroX. Uh, I mentioned that before. But you can crowdfund the prize and you you crowd uh, you basically crowdsource the development effort so there's two I mean the two elements the the funding for the prize and the actual work that people do in, in order to to win that comes in from from the crowds so it's it's an effective way to do it and therefore how do we do it well we we will prepare, so, so the two, two projects that we did want to do is, as I mentioned, the cordless drill. We are going to try to do that session where we, we actually uh, 3D print some parts, get a motor, battery pack, uh, do some free CAD on that. We are aiming to do the four hour session on that and see how far we get on that project. But that could be the seed of, a, of the Hero X challenge where then we document uh, what we have. But the biggest thing is designing the specification 
and then this designing the the rules the so-called rules which are how do you you know what is a winning entry mean what how do you encourage people to participate what do they do what are the rules that either encourage or discourage collaboration our challenge is going to be to to write the rules such that it maximizes collaboration and and kind of enforce that people keep uploading stuff to the wiki use common formats like like precad or part libraries that we already use um, within uh, the global village construction set so that uh, when someone comes into that they can pick up on that and build upon another another person's work so the hero x platform is something we will be doing and i'd like to do that also for for the the phone uh, a phone which is a tool that every single person on this planet uses so both a cordless drill and a phone a uh, cordless drill is a good example of a 3d printable item a phone is a great example of something that can be done largely with a cnc circuit mill then you can do the um, the case and other wrapper wrapper around that using 3D printing, but right now you have access to all the I mean all the chipsets for a, a phone like your GSM module, your you know your your CPU, your screen like touchstone screens. Those things all cost like ten twenty dollars these days. All all that is accessible. So if you can uh, put together a circuit around that and package it up nicely, it's actually a very well doable project within the within the public domain. So it's something we definitely want to try, simply because everybody uh, has one, and I do believe there is a enough of a population in a in a world that wants to hack hack their products or environmentally conscious enough to say, hey, I don't want to be throwing out my phone every couple of years or something like that. I know that my phone's right here. I mean, I'm borrowing Katrina's phone. I hope I don't crack it by the end of the workshop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do a lot of <laughs> I do a lot of video all over the place, and my phone's going about three to six months. So for me, it would be a very direct, um, uh, you know, direct environmental benefit if I can build my own phone and then um, then be able to replace the parts mm -hmm. uh, truly modular way. Have you <clears throat> heard of like I think it's called a block phone? Yeah, 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 and exactly that. So, so let's take a look at that. There's several open source phone, phone projects that are already so-called doing this. Uh, like, yeah, the uh, whatever that is. It's actually by the guy that did Precious Plastic. Uh, phone it, blocks. Phone blocks is a, is an example of one. Google took over that. Some other groups took over. That never t ended up to be a product. I think that failed. Uh, there, there's some couple other ones that also did that, but the idea there was, I mean, they were trying to go for a full blown out commercial, uh, mainstreamable kind of a deal. Whereas for us, we can be, you know, less less precise. We can be more DIY user centric, and make it happen because those pieces uh, do all exist. I mean, in the worst case, we wouldn't have a phone that's you know tight and as much as powerful as this. It might be bigger, more more bulky, but still, I mean, uh, if if it's got basic functionality, I certainly would use it. If it's something like the size of an iPad or something, still I would still want to use it. And I think there's many people that would also want to do that. So our current plan right now is to is to fundraise. So so the fundraising for the incentive challenge, one, you can do crowdfunding within the HeroX itself. So you can you can spawn a crowdfunding campaign just like Kickstarter. It goes concurrently with with the, the project. Or then before that, you can organize your effort and, and fundraise from corporations and things like that. For example, I talked to people like our favorite company, Lulzbot. Uh, I talked to Jeff Mo. He's willing to throw in 10K on this. Uh, I was actually aiming to, to generate like 100K. We do like 50K on the cordless, uh, the cordless drill construction set and like 50K on the phone, phone project. Uh, but basically, uh, I think we can motivate it. You know, the idea is, do you get buy-in for, for this kind of stuff? Well, it's, if it's public, true public interest, development, everyone benefits. Uh, yeah, you can get buy-in. That's, that's the difference here, that you can motivate people be, because of the pub, public interest nature, nature of that. And an incentive challenge, uh, if it's a, it's a monetary prize, that definitely gets a lot of people involved. So uh, we want to try that and, and make it work. Once again, the, the biggest deal to that is, is getting very specific, okay, uh, so getting our heads around, okay, what exactly, you know, direct it as much as possible versus it being super loose in terms of its definition. If you define it and specify it as explicitly to, to drive towards what you want, you can do it. But that's, that's the hard part, because as I talked about in the concept of degeneracy, um, 
two groups should should aim towards a similar solution given that the specification is is good or correct and and to extend the the generacy concept there um, if the specification is good enough the mark of a good specification is if two people end up with a similar result i would say so so that that will be the challenge in this to basically designing this project in a way that can be solved by a lot of people using accessible tools but but there's tons of people hundreds of thousands of thousands of people that already have 3d printers um, uh, not a lot of them have cnc circuit mills but definitely 3d printing is really huge. Um, maybe maybe there's a few million printers out there, uh, largely by you know a lot of it is by DIY people, just individuals who, who may be interested in this. So focusing the the cordless drill tra challenge around the the 3D printing aspect would be a great way to do it. Uh, and you can push things further by saying, hey, you actually have to start from scrap plastic and, and extrude your filament and do that. I mean, we can make those rules. I mean, that would definitely cut out many people that, that would participate. But what if you set the rules such as, okay, uh, you get points for whichever aspect you do. If you contribute to the extruder part, you get so many points. If someone builds upon it and actually uses your design to do the final product, you might, you might score. And so, we, you know, it's not necessarily that if we expanded the scope and difficulty that you get less participation. I think if you design it in the correct way, you can get even more participation to make it make it an even better project. So, uh, but it all um, also in this we do uh, for best results we would you know the people who do participate we would have to produce some kind of training materials for them in order for for them to to work more along the route of what we do. Because right now, for example, things like like FreeCAD, I mean, hardly anyone uses it. Uh, so maybe a really good documentation on FreeCAD would, would help a lot of people because everyone just uses the proprietary packages like the free like Fusion 360 or whatever which are free online things but are not open source so you know don't really fit fit with our game um, so you know we'll see how we can make those um, um, encourage people to use open tools throughout it but we can we can make those rules happen and maybe you know, maybe we get less people participating but maybe we get even more if we if we do it right so um, the the part I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is also the, the development template itself for, uh, yeah, I, I think we want to, I'll just do a, just a little bit on the development template, but for, for a lot of people to collaborate effectively on the work that we do on open product development, part of the taxonomy that has to be understood is all the development steps that do go into any kind of a hardware project so let me just go through through them briefly because that's something that you know in a fellowship program or any collaborators that want to collaborate with us for for longer you do have to have this awareness of the different steps of just what's what's natural in a game of product development which comes from standard product development literature and that we adopted more specifically for how we do open hardware with open tools in open Okay, in the product development literature, uh, if you read some of the later, latest papers, there is indication that open modular design is the way that more design will be shifting towards in the future. Modular because it then can become more interoperable and open source because as things get more complicated, there's a higher incentive as you move forward to build upon prior art in an effective way. Because as technology gets hard, you know, more, more and more advanced or sophisticated, there's more knowledge that goes into any product. And therefore, there's a natural tendency for um, more open source rather than less. Just like when I went to the Linux, Linux uh, Leadership Summit, um, I found that all the Googles and Facebooks are shifting towards open development on every, just about everything that they do. And they monetize on top of that, but the core underneath, just like with the telephony companies, they're they're making more open, well, open open source as the as the process. And probably part of that is like AI for for modern software, AI or computer vision. I mean, it's so complicated that you couldn't do it without 
open sourcing modules that you build upon. So there's definitely a tendency for open. And the product development literature, if you read the papers on that, I've got uh, a page on a wiki called Open Source Product Development. It lists some of the, the latest papers, which was very encouraging when I read it, because the people are, um, you know, the, the forward thinkers are saying open source and modular will be the way products are designed in the future. And that's not how it happens today. Most, most stuff is not open source or modular. Uh, a lot of people have their, their own thing and don't, don't interoperate in many fields. But that is, uh, so the good news that the writing on wall is, is for more open in the future. So uh, let's go, just, uh, just want to cover a little bit of the development template. We did go through the template. Once again, because I mean, we'll be beating this over and over through the, the immersion program. There's a video on that development template page that tells you how to set that up for any project. Any project that we do do, no matter how small, uh, because I mentioned that every, every hardware build is a, effectively a fork. You want to set one of these up, a development template, which lists all your assets for every single project. And the wiki is good for that because the wiki is infinitely scalable like Wikipedia. Um, it's, it's a definitely scalable process. So um, the full development template, and I'll just go through uh, what over the years we have kind of refined as the uh, 42 mo most important aspects of a development and mixes some of the technical development and then goes on to, um, yeah, at the 42 item level, it's mostly about the technical development for what you need for people to build upon, including some documentation. But let me kind of briefly going through this, you always want to start with requirements. You define those to, to, to define what you're trying to solve so that there's no ambiguity of, of what the goals are. And the requirements can, can also include uh, what functionality you're after, some performance, uh, performance specifications, uh, you can get as detailed as possible in the requirements. I mean, the, uh, you can go take that to a very, very, very far, but typically you want to define your requirements, and then you develop some, you find more info in our normal iterative process, you go back to the requirements, you might modify them to make them more precise, like tune them in. And if you can tune the requirements into to extremely specific, then, I mean, you're on your way to get a lot of people producing meaningful content. Um, we have a thing like an infographic, so if we are having, you know, if we have our general development uh, pages for every machine, we produce an infographic to show the basics that will get people on board as quickly as possible to what the main modules of a, of a machine are. Conceptual design, naturally you have to start with concepts like how you would, uh, given a tech tree of choices for how a thing can be built, you, you start with conceptual de design to say, okay, we're going to pick this particular concept and run with it. Module breakdown is the absolute critical part that I mentioned for modular design where we're breaking parts down, uh, breaking machines down into modules. You can break the modules down into parts and further modules, sub-modules, a uh, critical part for parallel development. Interface design is the thing that must follow the modules because you need to know how they fit together. Uh, then you, you go into Oh, hi. Hello, hello. Then you go into, so we're on, so we're on uh, the page. I can actually share the, I mean, for the Jitsi meeting. Okay, so we're sharing, sharing the screen here. Um, interface design goes with module breakdown all the time. You have to know how fit, things fit together. Now, part libraries, you can get specific. Like, if you want to get somebody a head start on how to design something, for example, for the 3D printer, of course, you put your access system, you put your critical components that you already use into that system, so you can use them as they are, and then people can build upon them or modify them. Uh, you start within CAD, the three-dimensional language that anybody can use if you've got access to open software. Part library is important. So 3D CAD now becomes the integration of part libraries into working sub-modules, modules. Do you want to save your 3D CAD at the at the part level, module level, machine level, so that uh, you can start developing where, wherever is most appropriate. Uh, 3D CAD parts, I forget what that is, no, let's skip that. 3D print substitutions. Um, for a lot of different devices, there might be places where 
uh, it's very convenient to, to produce something that's 3D printed instead of an off-the-shelf part. Like, for example, in the grinder, it was very convenient to print the, the, the bearing holder as opposed to getting like a $50 or $100 hex bearing, with, or actually ones that I couldn't find. I couldn't find any ones that had a bearing on them. They, they had these weird mounts. Uh, so 3D part su print substitution is where you, you just analyze the whole, whole machine and say, okay, which of these things should I be 3D printing if that's part of the, the normal fuel infrastructure that I have? Calculation. So that gets into the engineering, whether that's, that's computer-aided engineering, simple back-of-the-envelope calculations, uh, basics, that you, you, various calculators on the internet that you can apply readily, like beam deflection for knowing how much your axis is going to bend when it's so long, things like that. Uh, strengths, compressive strengths such as how, much, how tall can you, can you build your building before the bricks actually start collapsing upon one another, things like that. Hydraulics diagrams, we work with a lot of hydraulics. Hydraulics can also apply to house, like, like house plumbing systems. But hydraulics and tractors and, and high-power hydraulics, um, you have hydraulics diagrams to, to define how your power is distributed, for example, in a microtractor. Functional diagrams are useful for defining an abstraction of the functions of a given machine. So there's a lot of diagramming that can be done. Electronic schematics, so now getting into electronics for, for what the circuits actually are. Then getting into electronics layouts, which are the actual millable files that you can get get from the schematics, which are where the schematics are just the abstraction of what what parts exist there, without necessarily considering the routing of how everything is connected. Wiring diagrams may be some simple simpler things, like for example the graphical wiring diagram of the 3D printer on a D3D controller page, where you, you show diagrams of how things are plugged in. Software that's a big big can of things which would be firmware or software or anything that's, that's code. Bills of materials, uh, naturally you need, that's, that's a very important thing. Well, some, some of the most important things are your CAD, your bill of materials, uh, fabrication procedures. Um, so BOM is, ranks very, very top because that tells you what you're actually doing. That's the secret sauce when, when you want to reverse engineer some machine. Like first you have to know where you're going to get it, like what you're going to do what you're gonna build with, where are you gonna get it? Those two things must be embodied in a, in a bill of materials. We like to do visual bills of materials where we specify, um, well, we, we do things like whether it's little CAD clips, clippings, or actual clippings, just copy and paste from Amazon, which shows how the actual parts look, and, and you can show, show a diagram of, of arrows pointing to the different parts that you represent visually so you can understand it in a better way. Uh, CAM files are computer-aided manufacturing files, so for example, STL files are CAM files, or DXF files, which show like the cutouts for flat steel, um, computer-aided manufacturing, anything that the computer, uh, a CNC machine takes in order to, to produce with it. Cut lists, like for example, we have cut lists like make 38-inch make wires, 37-inch wires, 39-inch wires, make 30 wires of 3 feet for an extender for such and such, make the rods, uh, you know, whatever, 28 inches, 32 inches, and so forth. That has to be defined in numbers and um, numbers, so that when you get into the workshop, you first typically operate in a build, you typically operate in a cut list, so you get all your parts cut, and then that's ready. And, and, and it could go to, like, for example, when we prepare the box, as, as we're, I think this time around, we're wasting a lot, a lot of time on just trying to get parts. So once again, the box, the ready box with all the parts, that would, up, that would be an implementation of the cut list. You put all the parts in there and save that kind of uh, confusion from within the, a build like we have today and stuff like that. Test-driven prototypes is as you go along, you want to test things as soon as possible, either, either as, as scale models or anything, a paper model. It could be a calculation. Uh, it could be anything that simulates short of you doing the real thing. Or it could be just one thing that you test in isolation. So that would be a test-driven design um, concept, as in the agile, the extreme manufacturing concept. Build instructions, naturally, that's, that's a critical part. Uh, to me, the most, most refined set of build instructions is language agnostic instructionals, ones that are so clear, so complete, uh, and so graphical that you don't need to use words because the, the, the graphics already explain it. Fabrication drawings, that is uh, dimension, dimension drawings of parts, like say you gotta make, 
make something like the panel for the electronics, the fabrication drawing would specify the exact distances and sizes of holes, as an example. Um, visual fabrication diagram would be one where you can actually, from, we've done this a lot before, where you have the CAD, after you have the complete CAD, you isolate one part, then you copy and paste it, you say, okay, this part plus this part, they go into this next part, and so forth, so you can kind of diagram out a whole, uh, a whole build on a, in a graphical way, and that helps people see, see how all the parts come together down to the final machine. So at the very end, the tree is branched out to many, many multiple parts, and then goes down to, to the final product. And you can do that for every module, because the whole machine would get, there's be, gonna be a lot of parts at the top, so you want to break it down. And to, to, to communicate that effectively, that's, that takes some skill in communication. Explode part diagrams are like you see a lot in typical manuals where, where you have the diagram like in black and white and just everything is ex exploded along an axis or multiple axes that separates out the parts so you see what all the individual parts are as opposed to the whole assembly. Explode part animations, you can add a little bit more uh, aesthetics to that through animations like FreeCAD does explode part animations. <coughs> Uh, which also allow you to separate something in, in a short video, so you can see the progression of how something goes together. And actually playing a, an exploit part animation in reverse will then get you somewhat of a build procedure. Language agnostic instructionals, that's, that's actually, we, we classify that as a separate thing beyond the build instructions, because the build instructions can be as simple as just plain words, but you typically want to have pictures, but the language agnostic instructions are no words, all pictures. Parallel production engineering, so you have to think about, okay, what are all the steps that can be do done together, and based on the number of people you have for the build, you, you want to allocate roles accordingly. So ideally, we would have had that all planned out for, for this event, but then again, you can't plan out too much of that because some people might tend to like other things, maybe they have special skills, so you kind of have to play by ear on parallel production engineering. So that, then you go to the data collection after the build parts. So data collection is critical, so you can build upon and, and then the person that builds it next doesn't fall into the same mistakes that you have. Unfortunately, we've had, like, when people replicate it several times, like both of the tractors, three of the tractors, I mean, they made several mistakes that we could have told them if they spoke to us, you know, before the build. Um, and we do have that communicated on the wiki and in various locations, but the most direct sources communicate with the author. And the first thing, if you want, to re you want to build upon another person's work, number one thing is contact the author. Find out what the latest thing is, because documentation always lags behind the, behind the re reality. That's, that's always the case. I mean, for us, you see that clearly here, too. So, um, build upon people's work by documenting everything. So, build videos, so that's useful. Uh, things like time lapses are great. We're capturing some video. Also, build data collection, so sitting uh, with a notebook and saying, okay, this step took so, so long, etc., so that you, you can, you can uh, learn for the next time, or just trouble spots, uh, of which we ran into many. Uh, that needs to be documented, making sure that for the next time we don't run into those same issues. And then a lot of times you find out that, okay, you, you correct one thing, and once you fixed everything and you're perfect, you think, and some new issues might resurface, so it's always about revisiting to the point that, okay, it is solid and stable. Um, that's the ideal. Performance data collection, so, so on top of just build data, you want to gather performance data. Like, for example, after we run the 3D printer, um, did it print on the first try? What was the issue? How fast can it print? Can you just crank it up to 150%, 200%, or 500%? Where does it fail? Uh, maybe it starts vibrating too much or the whole thing or the head pops off the, the axis or something. I've never had that happen yet. Um, review. Review is where you would um, get subject matter experts to, to take a look at your, your designs or your data and say, hey, uh, what can we do better? So recruiting a dedicated team of SMEs, subject matter experts, for review is one of the other aspects that we can be developing throughout this project so that we get external feedback, not just our small group, but anyone from, from anywhere. Um, someone who might have just a very little time but is, but is an expert in something, they might be able to provide excellent feedback, especially people who are um, 
more the practitioners, the guys who are using something like you have designed or have experience with it. That's that's when the feedback is, is valuable, of course, as opposed to armchair theorists who are speculating on things. So you want to go find the people who have a lot of experience in something. Uh, future work is you want to define, uh, based on the data that you've collected, you will find things, okay, now we need to solve this. Document that as future work. Bug tracker, it will list, it will list uh, the things that are wrong. Uh, that you need to work on maybe, it could be minor or major. There can be a product release with bugs. There, for example, um, as long as you, there might be basic functionality that's available, but if you're releasing something that's got bugs, you make that clear, okay? The bug, the bug, bug report or um, your documentation and the bug trackers you should show, okay, we've got everything working, but I don't know, whatever, whatever was wrong. Be aware of the, the shortcoming of that so that you, your expectations are met when using the thing. Like with the filament maker, we know that the thing works for ABS, but the disclaimer already that we know is also, well, for PLA, we don't have the formula yet. We gotta tune it to what, what it has to be. So write that down, you know, whatever, as, as much as you can write down, you should, because then people don't go into it say, thinking that this can do one thing and it can't, um, or the other way around, if you don't document how well it performs, they might just say, ah, that's just, like for us, they might say, oh, that's just another 3D printer. But then we can say, oh, well, we actually got these certain features that you'd really be interested in, and this is why, um, and so forth. So, uh, background, I actually put background research at the very end because uh, I start with development. But before you do any development, you want to do a lot of background research. like. If you're developing a machine for the Global Village Construction Set, you want to take a look at the product ecology. What is what else is in the set that that makes it fit? If you're designing the CNC circuit mill, you want to understand that it's got the universal axis and the, the ramps board or other parts that already exist in other parts of the system, and maybe manufactured with other tools within the set, like a CNC torch table for the frame or other things. What else do we have in the system? Like eventually, it'll be down to the induction furnace where you can take sc scrap steel and build it. Uh, but you want to be aware of what, what else fits with that particular item so that when you're designing, that's a, a consideration in your specifications, which means that you're going to be designing a particular way, not just some far out way that's like, okay, it's just not relevant because that's not how we're designing it. You have to look at product ecology as the first thing so that it fits because we're not designing one thing at a time. We're designing 50 things at a time. In fact, we're designing a civilization at a time because we're saying we're stripping down a lot of the excess we're saying we're making a nucleus, a kernel, that can be sufficient. And of course it's going to avoid a lot of the different complexities and it might avoid a lot of the um, non-essentials non or just particular ways of doing things. And it will focus on certain ways of doing things because they say they are sufficient or otherwise appropriate. And that is expressed in the product ecology. Then for OSC specifications, and by the way, each of these items is hyperlinked, so you can click on what each, each of these means. But OSC specifications, that's a lengthy page. It's got about 50 to, a, it's about, about 100 or so lot point items that define the certain values that we, that we go for. Main, main ones being scalability, modularity, public design, open source. Those are some of the main ones. But then we get more refined into what are all the other values. So if you follow OSC specifications and the design requirements, that's what I'm saying. You should degenerate to a very similar solution set when you do a certain development. How it works. So how it works is the kind of questions Alex was asking. He was asking basic questions of, okay, well, how does this 3D printer work? You want to ex ex explore that and, and clarify that for anyone who does not have any familiarity with it so they can also become familiar. Tech tree of choices. So for any technology, you have multiple ways of doing things. Uh, for the axis, we have a choice of lead, using like lead screws, which are super precise, very strong, accurate, but also 10 times more expensive. So we choose belts. So, so you have to understand your tech tree of choices. You have this choice, you have another, you have, you have many, and you pick a one that, that fits your requirement. Background reading. So for any project, you should have um, a background reading list that shows some of the most seminal work. I mean, okay, first the seminal work. Like what is the, for example, the first 3D printer that was built in the world? What is that? What is the, what is the now the current good literature or, or whatever paper or a publication that explains 3D printing. Have that available for people so they can catch up to speed really quickly as opposed to looking for a bunch of things that are not really essential or low quality. 
You want to start refining throughout. This whole st process is about refining, getting people up to speed faster for quick learning. Background research and patent search. So before you do anything, patents are still very useful. So you can look at the U.S. Patent Office and you can just Google patents on Google search and 3D printing patent, pat patent or a patent for a heated bed. Just start looking at the keywords that you already know from all the other parts here and you can start gleaning great insight. I mean, patents, uh, they seem like a bit complicated, but they're actually not. If you start looking at patents, they're going to show you like diagrams. They're going to be conceptual because they'll never tell you how you really do it because patents are not supposed to tell you how to really do it. They're not, patents are not like open source. It's far from it. It doesn't have any bills of materials, any kind of build procedures. It just tells you concepts of what's protected. But still, that information focuses on design rationale, which is quite valuable for what we do. You, you find out how they do it and why they do it. And then you can apply that to the way we want to do things. So don't throw the, the patents out. They're definitely good. Even though they're protected, if it's 19 years old, then you can use it unless someone renewed the patent. Most people don't care about patents more than 19 years old. They're moving on to new technology. But we talk about sufficiency. What technology level is sufficient for, for us to be able to work with it and solve many, prob many issues, uh, address many needs, without necessarily being the latest and greatest, because that's not always necessary. There's a sufficiency criterion for what you want to do. If you want to build an integrated system, you don't go to the, necessarily to the peak technology. You go to the technology that's peak technology for the system, for the interactions that it has. So just because it works peak performance on one item, what if you consider two, three, or ten items like we consider? Well, that may be thrown out because it doesn't have that <coughs> integrated efficiency on multiple fronts. And that's why for us a lot on the pat patent search could be very useful for what we want to do. Uh, background research, so you start just Googling and things like that. Industry standards are things that are built currently that's looking through a catalog of, you know, like uh, looking at what John Deere does or whoever. Industry standards, you, you start exploring what everyone else is doing to see how, how you can learn from that. Technology, technology assessment. So whenever we see some technology, we want to pass it through, start passing it through some filters. How does that fit through all these specifications? Uh, and maybe like make notes and assessments of, okay, this is a great concept, but just doesn't scale. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit well in us. So, so maybe document some of those notes of how, uh, when, you, when you study something, document that so the next person can read about that uh, if, they, if they're willing to, to spend the time doing that. And if you refine the technology assessment, you know, people build upon you, you write some basic comments, the next person on a wiki maybe does more, you can get to some very high quality assessments. So, so like on forums, forums are very low on technology assessment. Like people start blabbing about things, a lot of people that don't know anything about the topic, it's a lot of speculation. But that wouldn't be technology assessment. It's like, it's, it's technology assessment is basically the, the forum plus rigorous building upon all those comments and like maybe uh, refactoring them to do like, imagine like a, a forum had, okay, now here's all the discussion, and then some, the master of that forum would be, okay, so given all that we learned, plus these other things, here's like what, what the real story is actually, regard, you know, building upon what people said, 90% of that is not true, here's the stuff that actually is quite decent, and there's general consensus that that's applicable, you can get some of that through, through the assessment. <coughs> <coughs> Documenting the value proposition is important, so to be very clear about what exactly it is that we're offering. Um, and for us, it's scalable modular. Um, that, those are the, some of the two. Scalar, scalable modular distributive. Distributive as in we are helping others to, to replicate. We are open about others producing things. So uh, be clear about what the particular value proposition is for what you have. That might differentiate from, every, differentiate from everybody else. No one in the world has a scalable 3D printer. Um, no, I'm not, I don't really know of modular ones where you can do the interchange like we can. And certainly nobody's um, a distributive about it. But the closest, I mean, the closest I would say to, to distributive would be Lowsbot. That's why I like them. But they publish everything up to even their operations manuals and documents that define how they do their IT and things like that so you can learn from it. And I actually picked that up and it's all on their server, you can download it on their development server, you can actually learn from it. They use uh, the Odoo Community Edition, that's the 
uh, open ERP used to be you know, they use that so you can learn how how to work with that and you can contact them to for technical assistance and, th and that's that's so close to that ideal state where another company actually a lot fosters um, helps you to this um, to learn rapidly about what you're trying to do in open source so ideally all that stuff is documented and available by others who already have taken the steps and then you can uh, stand on the shoulder of giants. So, okay, so that's about it. That's a quick walkthrough of the basic development template, what, what all goes in there. But this is the kind of understanding we all have to have to see what's, what's involved in that process. Any questions on this all together? Or? Do Perfectly you use clear. Software for hydraulic, uh, we don't. We use we just use Google Docs, and what we typically do is we have uh, cut and paste like the standard components, like the valve, like the fittings, the hoses. We just copy and paste them, so it's kind of it's kind of like a little bit of a construction set. We have a a page page of icons that we use for that. So those are the kinds of things that, that are very important to to document and have in one place. So we should have one for hydraulics, for plumbing. Maybe for three D printer, so you can like in the easiest instance, you can actually take a, something as simple as a Google Doc, and if it has all the all the images, and that you can attach a hyperlink to an image, so it could actually be a sourcing link as well. You just copy and paste into another document, and you can start designing the conceptual framework for for the next version or something like that. That's that is very useful. But we don't have any specific software we use right now, but I'm sure there's things we could do better. Is there any calculation where you can take for uh, heat transfer? Any calculations for heat travel? For heat transfer? There are actually FreeCAD has that capacity for doing heat transfer calculations. So that's within the finite element modeling module of FreeCAD. So as I said, FreeCAD is incredible, and anyone can design new new modules for that. So anything else? Okay, so yeah, let's quit here then. Any questions from the audience? Do we have uh, Chaz? Anybody else? Oh, we've got a few people out there. Any questions from the audience? Regarding the development of content? At the moment, um, I'm going to just have no time with the money trip to see family this weekend and I'm a bit busy. I think you already know I'm most interested in the yeah. Yeah. So you're saying 3D printing for making some scale models, you're saying? Or are you saying something different? Yeah, yeah, actually, so about that, we were thinking that we can sell kits or produce kits or make it available, basically modeling kits for the CD to home parts, because that's some, there's actually a kit out there, I forget the name of it, but uh, basic, basic shapes that are the basic modules, and you can make all the different configurations of the CD to home, just like you can build it in CAD, you can also cut it out from, from thin sheet, and make it kind of snap together, and that is actually a very useful thing that we would want to. But probably we'll get to it once we get to the CD go home part where we're actually creating the scale models because those would allow customers, for example, to say, okay, uh, sorry, we can't design for it, but here you go. You can download our kit or, you know, here's the kit. Uh, tell me the model you want. Build it, and then we're going to build it for you in real life. That is a powerful thing we could be doing. First of all, do we have questions? Hold on a second. Do we have any questions from the other people in the audience? Doesn't appear we do, or, or people are muted. Um, well, go ahead real quick. What's, maybe we can, we can start us thinking about it, and then we can continue the discussion later.
House party. I like it. That's that's a pretty good idea. And we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that. You mean we all shouldn't just move into a little mud hut, but get a real house? No, not necessarily. Just uh, kind of just to start off, and it's just a little bit of fun. Yeah, like no, that's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's actually quite good. I, I, I do like that, and you know, if we have the energy for that, as soon as we have the energy or the focus on that, that's something to do, uh, definitely. Uh, it would take some good effort, but I, I think the core design that we have already, what differentiates us, I mentioned the other kit project. Well, their kit is just something that you design as a kit, but it's not connected to any real modules. For us, that's different. We, we have the modules that actually stand as real scale models of the real thing, which is a completely different picture. You need value proposition there, and I think we can make it, make it work amazingly well. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to. Your documentation with the CD Kahom, Wiki House has their documentation. Right. I believe I was led into some other organization, but as far as I can tell, they are open sourcing their designs. So that's why my current interest is with your CD Kahom as well as Wiki House designs. And just so start as a seed project, just as a social experiment. Yeah. If comes out of that, great. And maybe that could be a market niche. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. We'll add it to our repository of good ideas. Yeah. 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 There's definitely a huge market for that. As I said, we always get emails from people saying, "When can you build me a little CD go home?" And we're saying, well, "As soon as we train the people." Is our answer so? Yeah, definitely the the interest from people is is huge wherever they are, whether Silicon Valley or in the backwoods or anywhere. Homes are homes, so yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to pop that out there. No, that's good. Thank you. Um